Every night, a somewhat bizarre scene takes place in Nouakchott Stadium. Overweight women, covered from head to toe in colorful veils, walk around the track for hours. Some of them even try, albeit a bit clumsily, to run. Among them, Aziza Mintnema. She has been coming here every night for the past month. I try to lose weight, she says, and it's also better for my health. This would have been unimaginable just a year ago. It's a good example of how much the attitude has changed here. Traditionally, Mauritanian women have always been fat. It is a symbol of beauty here. It is a sign of wealth. But this cultural tradition also brings a lot of drawbacks. Aware of the problem, the Mauritanian Department for Women has made fighting obesity one of its top priorities. In fighting obesity, she says, we mean to help women perform better in their daily lives, at work or at school. A fat woman, for example, is not able to go to university. Neya Minthali did not wait for instructions from the government to start paying attention to what she eats. But she's having trouble losing weight. This has to do with the fact that she was force-fed when she was young. Between the ages of 8 and 12, her mother used to give her 4 to 5 liters of milk every day so that she gained weight. This has scarred her both physically and mentally. I remember I had a tough time, she says. I used to be afraid of everyone around me. I was fearful they would hit me. Everyone was allowed to hit me so that I would not vomit. At 12, Neya weighed 104 kilos. Her mother decided to get her married. She had her first child at the age of 13. But Neya's story is not uncommon here. According to a recent study, 22% of Mauritanian women were force-fed when they were young. This tradition is slowly dying, in part due to the drought in the 90s, which led many nomadic tribes to settle in big cities. But force feeding is still widespread in rural areas. Like here, in Birelvos. This small village was created two years ago, when nomadic tribes decided to settle in this area. There are no houses here, only tents, as is their tradition. Every day looks the same for nine-year-old Huda. Her mother wakes her up in the wee hours of the morning to give her the first bowl to drink, one liter of camel milk, soon followed by another. Huda's mother takes her duty of force-feeding her daughter very seriously. She carefully repeats the method inherited from her mother and her grandmother. Milk is very good for force feeding, she says, because it gives the skin a nice color and it provides a lot of fat rapidly. If you give solid food, the girl will also gain weight, but it will darken her skin and she will not grow fat as rapidly. Kuria explains that it is important to fatten up fast, the best way to get the desired stretch marks on the skin. <laughs> And to fatten up fast, the girl has to drink a lot, fast, even if it means forcing her to do so. In another tent a few meters away, seven-year-old Fatima gets the same treatment. Her mother told her how important it was for her to grow fat, otherwise she would not get a husband. So Fatima tries really hard to drink the two liters of camel milk she was given, even though she's starting to feel sick. <coughs> Vomiting is common at first, we've been told. The girl's stomach is not used to digesting such quantities of liquid. The mother has to be very cautious. One glass too many could burst the girl's stomach and kill her instantly. After a five minutes pause, another bowl is given to Fatima. At first, when we make them drink a lot, they vomit, she says. That is why we use the zaya, the traditional pliers, to squeeze their fingers or their feet. It hurts, and they forget about the urge to vomit.
According to statistics, one out of five girls has her fingers broken as a result of the force feeding. After the morning treatment, Huda and Fatima can enjoy a few hours of free time. They're not allowed to play outside with the other kids, but they can take as much time as they want to drink four or five liters of Srig, milk with water and sugar. This helps in the digestion, but it's mostly used to keep the stomach full in order to stretch it. With dusk comes the end of leisure time. Fatima has to drink another bowl, her fourth today. This time, her mother increases the pressure on her in order to avoid her daughter vomiting. <laughs> it is now midnight. Huda is woken up for one last bowl of milk. One bowl too many. <laughs> <laughs> Neya is an uncomfortable witness to the scene. She knows what Huda is going through, having experienced the same treatment years before. But Neya wants things to change in her country. She's created her own organization to do so. She now meets with the mothers of Huda and Fatima, listens to them, and tries to understand what motivates them to force feed their daughters. That way, she hopes to come up with viable alternatives. We can't just stop this treatment and not replace it by something else, she says. There's no school here. And since I can't provide my daughter with a valuable diploma, I'm investing in her beauty so that she can have a better future. It is important here to make women profitable, she says. They are force-fed so they can get married at a younger age, thus families can gain from them. Human beings seek to make things profitable, so if we help these girls go to school, they'll be able to find a job later, and they'll become profitable for their families. The most urgent thing is to build a school in this village. Unfortunately for Huda, Fatima, and thousands of other little girls in Mauritania, it is still faster and easier today to give kids a bowl of milk than to build them a school.